Welcome to this presentation of Partners for Safe Teen Driving. Your evaluation of this program is important to us. If possible, parents, guardians, please complete the pre-presentation quiz by using the QR code on the slide. This is a voluntary quiz. There will also be a short evaluation at the end of the meeting. Parents, you are here because not only do you hold the keys to the car, you are the key to keeping your teens safe. The research clearly indicates that parents have the greatest influence on teen behaviors. Parents, you must set clear expectations of driver safety for your family. As driver education educators, we want to partner with you to lay the foundation for safe driving behaviors for your teen and provide the essential knowledge and skills needed for good decision making. As parents, you must also build a sound structure of rules and consequences that will discourage your teen from making unsafe choices. Teens, it's up to you to build trust and make sound choices. For parents or guardians who speak Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Dari, Farsi, Korean, Pashto, Urdu, or Vietnamese, you can follow this presentation by using the QR code on this slide. Virginia gives parents a key role in teaching teens to drive, giving permission for the teen to get his or her learner's permit, withholding driving privileges until they feel their teen is ready and or mature enough to drive, enforcing graduated licensing laws, suspending driving privileges if the teen is not being responsible. During this presentation, we will address each of these topics. When the kids are young, you look for the best daycare. You look for the best car seat. And all of a sudden, your kid is old enough to drive. Parents should help their kids be the best drivers they can be. Help them become functional, safe, competent adults without dying first. The leading cause of death among adolescents is motor vehicle crashes. It's a misconception to think that teens don't understand the risks of driving. They do. But the challenge is with teens is that when they're in the moment, they might make the wrong decision. Parents play a key role in preventing teen crashes. When asked whose opinions they listen to, teens most often set their parents. Safe driving is really about judgment. We know that it's not till they're about 25 that the prefrontal cortex, the CEO of the brain, is completely developed. And a lot of the things that aren't developed are the risk management, decision making, and types of things that they need to be a good, safe driver. The number one crash risk for teens is inexperience. They need to practice with the parent so that the parent can pass on their knowledge and experience. The more hours, the better, and in a variety of conditions. On a winter day, there's parking lots all over the place. Work on skid controls. That way, when the, the situation does arise, they're ready to go. We see that there are two big things that are affecting teens. Number one, it's an experience, and number two, it's distraction. Distractions. And what might be some common distractions? Eating, drinking, texting, anything that has to do with not looking on the road. They don't understand the challenges of distraction, and I think parents can help by just setting rules set in place the expectation that driving is a privilege that you earn. And you earn it by showing maturity, showing good skill, and graduated driver licensing, which is the law that's in most states, allows parents to build on that. The first stage is the learner's permit, where the teen is driving with adult supervision. The second stage is where a teen can drive by themselves, but they have certain restrictions, such as not being allowed to drive with other teen passengers in the car or driving at night. And the third stage is full licensure. We suggest that before teens get their independent license, that the teen and the parent negotiate the driving privileges that the teen will have for a period of time. The parent who is an authoritative parent who actually sets rules, make sure the teen follows it, you work on that together, those teens are half as likely to crash. While learning driving skills is very important, driving skills alone do not reduce risky behaviors. Risky behaviors are bad decisions that have little to do with driving skill. Study after study has shown that parent involvement reduces risk behaviors in teen driving crashes. 
So we hope that what you learn tonight will open up a deeper dialogue with your teens about choices and that you will closely monitor and continuously guide your teens' driving behavior. For the first topic, we will discuss teen driving risks and the teenage brain. What is safe driving? Is it skill? Is it good decision making? Is it ticket free driving? Parents and teens have different definitions of good driving. Parents believe a good driver is a safe driver. They believe a safe driver means adequate safe following distance, obeys the speed limit, and behaves like a responsible adult. Teens believe they are a good driver if, for example, they can take a curve at a higher rate of speed and not crash. Researchers believe this different perception of safe driving is due to the fact that the part of the teenage brain that understands risk is not fully developed. Motor vehicle crashes can happen to anyone, even good teens crash. That's because all new drivers lack experience and are more likely to crash. Throughout this presentation, we will be addressing these teen driving risks in more detail. How do teens handle nighttime driving? Teens get very little exposure to driving at night with their parents, and they are also notoriously sleep deprived. How does the type of vehicle affect the teen driver's behavior? If you are planning on giving your teen a shiny red sports car, that may not be the best choice for your child. Your child is much less likely to race in the family van. How does the teenage brain handle a lack of parental guidance? The science is very clear. Parents matter and good parenting can significantly reduce teen crashes and prevent a tragedy. How does an immature brain handle alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs? The teenage brain has difficulty understanding consequences and risks. Unfortunately, teens may not think twice about driving while impaired. Raise your hand if you believe this statement is true. The brain does not mature until about age 25. That is true. The brain is about 80% developed in adolescence. The largest part of the brain, the cortex, is divided into lobes that mature from back to front. The last section to connect is the frontal lobe, responsible for cognitive processes such as reasoning, planning, and judgment. Normally, this mental merger is not complete until age 25. The teenage brain is not an adult brain with fewer miles on it. Teens have very sharp brains but they're not quite sure what to do with them. The teen brain has a tendency to underestimate dangerous situations and is attracted to thrill-seeking and other experiences that create intense feelings. This is why teens often speed, weave in and out of traffic, follow too closely, talk on their cell phones, or drive while fatigued or intoxicated. Consequently, parents must step in and serve as their teen's frontal lobes as the teenage brain has difficulty making risk management decisions on its own. Cars do not crash, people crash them. The driver, especially the young driver, continues to be a weak link in automotive safety. It's interesting to note that the crash data shows older teenagers with more driving time have more crashes. The higher crash rate for older teens is attributed to their having more driving privileges, fewer restrictions, and less parental supervision. This higher crash rate prompted the General Assembly to revise the juvenile passenger restrictions for older teens. Most teen crashes are caused by a lack of experience and attitude, not poor driving skill. And teens who take more risks are setting themselves up to crash regardless of their driving skills. Teens are more likely than older drivers to underestimate or not be able to recognize dangerous situations. They are also more likely than adults to make critical decision errors that can lead to serious crashes. Positive and negative attitudes evolve over time. They can be changed through experience and persuasion, and parents have the most influence over their teens' attitudes. She just loved people. She made friends easy, and uh, she had a lot of friends. Brenda was a good student. She loved to learn. She was really looking forward to going to college. And I never will forget when uh, she had been looking, she had been watching the mail close for her acceptance letter to see if she got into JMU. And um, she went to the mailbox that day and she came on back. She came through that door and she said, yes, yes, yes. 
And she opened up the envelope, you know, and she looked and she read it. She's, and I can see her now. She just, yes, 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 she said. It was a beautiful January day. The sky was so pretty and blue and the sun was bright. And it was just a lovely day. And that particular day, she didn't have to be to school till 11 o'clock. She sat there and she ate a bowl of cereal and she changed clothes three times before she left. When she got in the truck, she put a seat belt on. When she sat in a vehicle, if she was going to drive or if she was riding, she always put a seat belt on. And uh, anyway, that morning the police scan was on and I just, in the back of my mind, I heard them say that there had been a bad accident on Route 130. And uh, I get on down there and and uh, this is a fireman in the road, you know, directing traffic. And I can see a truck, and I could see the bumper, and I saw the sticker. And I knew it was our truck. So I, I pulled off to the side of the road, and I asked that fireman, I said, a little girl driving that truck, I said, is she hurt bad? He said, are you kin to her? I said, yes, I'm her mother. And by that time, two rescue squad workers, one, one got one side of me and one got on the other side. And uh, I said, the, the little girl driving that truck, I said, is she hurt bad? And the woman said, yes, ma'am. I said, is she dead? She said, yes, ma'am. Be proactive. We should not change because of a tragedy. Parents should establish preventative measures that will prevent a tragedy from occurring. Parents, to keep your teens safe, you must be proactive and communicate that you are in control. Their lives depend on it. And teens, you will learn, if you haven't already, that trust is something that is earned and through responsible actions and decisions can be sustained. What kind of role model are you? A study by Liberty Mutual and SAD found that parents are setting a poor example for teens by engaging in unsafe driving behaviors, such as texting and driving, and are not listening to their teens' warnings. 41% of teens say their parents continue these unsafe behaviors even after their teens ask them to stop, and 28% of teens say their parents justify unsafe behaviors. If you make the choice to speed or talk on the phone, remember, your student is watching and learning. Being an experienced driver does not excuse bad habits. Parents' choices help kids form opinions on acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. We also know from research into underage drinking and driving that parents who exhibit DUI behavior may promote youth drinking and DUI behaviors. Parental permissiveness is consistently associated with negative drinking consequences as youth transition to college or adulthood. Parents should always model safe driving behaviors as teens learn from the choices that adults make. Let's talk now about getting a learner's permit and teaching your teen to drive. For a teen to obtain a learner's permit in Virginia, the teen must have parent permission, be at least 15 years and six months old, provide proof of identity, residency and legal presence, be a U.S. citizen legally authorized to be in the U.S., and pass a signed and knowledge test. Go to the DMV website at dmv.virginia.gov to find the closest customer service center and ours. During the learner's permit phase, you should not have to add your child to your family's automobile insurance policy, but it is always a good idea to check with your insurance company. Unfortunately, approximately 50% of the teens who take the learner's permit test do not pass it on their first attempt. If your teen fails the learner's permit test three times, your teen must provide DMV with evidence that they have completed the classroom driver education course after the third failure or have taken an eight-hour re-examination course before they will be able to take the learner's permit test a fourth time. Teens should be encouraged to take the learner's permit test prior to completing classroom driver education. If your teen passes a classroom driver education course after failing the learner's permit test three times, your teen can take the permit test for the fourth time. Hopefully your teen will study and pass the test on the first attempt. 
So now your teen has their learner's permit and is ready to get behind the wheel. And parents, are you ready? You will need to certify that your child has driven at least 45 hours, with 15 of those hours being after sunset, before your teen can get their license. Practice driving should be more than just accumulating time to satisfy the requirements of the law. Practice driving should include meaningful, planned, guided practice sessions that include all driving skills and environments. Teens do not easily adapt to new driving situations. They need a parent mentor who follows the lessons in the 45-hour guide so that the new driver learns to navigate new territory safely and practices driving skills correctly. Most parents are not trained to be driver educators, but they need to know how to gradually and safely expose their student to a variety of driving situations to learn skills and identify and correct driving errors. The 45-hour parent teen driving guide provides suggested lessons that are sequential, meaningful learning goals, and strategies and coaching tips. These lessons progress from low to higher risk driving environments, from a parking lot to neighborhood roads, to light traffic, to rural highways, to expressways, and then to city driving. Using the Parent Teen Driving Guide, parents can plan driving lessons and practice often to hopefully accumulate more than 45 hours of guided practice over the nine month period that your teen must hold a learner's permit. Parents should complete the driving log at the end of each practice session. Let's go through some things that will help you teach your teen to drive. First, plan for this to be an enjoyable time together. This is a great bonding opportunity. Focus on the driving task and leave family issues at home. But don't wait until you have an emergency to learn how to control the vehicle from the passenger seat. In a parking lot with your teen in the driver's seat, practice steering and controlling the car with your left hand. You can also control the speed of a vehicle from the passenger seat. If you have a car with a parking brake between the seats, practice stopping the car by depressing the release button and raising the parking brake. If your student panics and accelerates too much, practice shifting the transmission from drive to neutral from the passenger seat. Parents, you should monitor traffic behind the vehicle by adjusting the passenger side view mirror or use the mirror on the sun visor as a rear view mirror. Check mirrors in the space to the sides and ahead of the vehicle before giving directions. Keep instructions simple and concise. First, direct where to go, and then state the actions to take. For example, at the next intersection, turn right. While your teen is performing a maneuver, your feedback should be precise and immediate. If a mistake is made, repeat the maneuver, taking your teen step by step through the process, and then provide opportunities for additional practice without any assistance. Can you explain the critical element of a right turn? If not, you can review these critical elements in the 45-hour Parent Teen Guide. Talk with your teen in advance about how you plan to communicate during practice sessions. Encourage commentary driving. This is the most valuable tool you have for checking how your teen is processing the driving environment. Ask your teen to read the traffic picture aloud, describing anything that may affect your path of travel. For example, when your teen changes speed, they may say, red light, check mirror release foot off accelerator and begin braking. Actually, you should hear check mirror and ease off accelerator a lot. Reinforce that a green light means search the intersection before proceeding and to be on the lookout for drivers running a red light. Encourage your teen not to panic when approached by an emergency vehicle and to focus on looking for a safe area to pull over. Discuss the rules for passing a stop school bus with flashing lights. Encourage your teen to plan their route to avoid making difficult left turns. Teach them to look at the car's tires in contact with the road, not the body of the car, to calculate gap in traffic and the speed of the approaching vehicle. There is a lot to learn in each lesson in the 45-hour guide, so allow adequate time for your teen to attain mastery at each level before moving on to the next lesson. If possible, try to integrate night driving into each area of instruction. Talk to your teen about what they should do before they even start the car. Let's start with seat belts and a quick test. Please raise your hand if you think this statement is true. Everyone sitting in the front seat must wear a seat belt. This is true. Virginia law requires everyone in the front seat to wear a seat belt, and anyone less than 18 years of age must wear a seat belt regardless of where they are sitting in the vehicle. 
Wearing a seat belt is the simplest and most effective way to prevent car crash injuries and deaths. Unfortunately, teen drivers and teen passengers use safety belts less than any other age group. Safety belts keep you in the car and prevent you from hitting objects and passengers inside the vehicle if there is a crash. Parents should require safety belt use at all times. Buckling up is an easy way to prevent injuries and deaths. This simple task can reduce your teen's risk of dying or being badly injured in a crash by about half. Parents play a critical role in whether or not their children wear seat belts. Parents should not only model wearing a seat belt, they should enforce a strict family seat belt rule and have zero tolerance for non usage. Wearing a seat belt becomes a habit over a short period of time, and buckling up is a very good habit to have. Would you allow an unbuckled elephant to sit in your back seat? In a crash at 30 miles an hour, an adult backseat passenger without a seatbelt is thrown forward with a force of three and a half tons. The weight of an elephant charging straight through the drive. You're never safe in the back until you fasten your seatbelt. Never forget. Another thing you should review with your teen before they start the car is the mirror adjustments. The blind spot glare elimination mirror setting, also known as BGE, is now recommended. The BGE mirror setting reduces the blind zones around your car and the glare of the headlights from vehicles behind you. When you use the BGE mirror setting, you will see more of the lane next to your car and not the side of your vehicle. This allows you to monitor vehicles in the adjacent lanes. If you use the BGE mirror setting, do you still need to do a head check? Yes, you need to make a quick check over your shoulder in the area just outside your peripheral vision. You know the old adage, you have to look before you leap. Well, the same is true for driving. You have to be able to see where you're going in order to get there safely. Today, I'm gonna to show you the proper way to adjust your rear and side view mirrors. It seems easy enough. You adjust your mirror so that you can see behind you and everything's great. But I'm gonna show you a technique so that you can see into those blind spots coming up from the rear and beside your car. Now the proper way to adjust your driver's side mirror is to lean your head all the way over until you just about touch the glass, like this. Then adjust your mirror until you see just beyond your car. Just that little sliver? Yeah, you shouldn't see that. You're going to adjust just beyond that. That's going to allow you to see just beyond the blind spot on the driver's side of the car. You don't need to see your car, but you do need to see the lane next to you and see the car that's in it. Now for the passenger side mirror, you want to lean over towards the center of the car as far as you can and then adjust your mirror again so that you see just beyond the side of your car. This will allow you to see into the three quarter view blind spot on your passenger side. Now for the rear view mirror, that's simple. Most people do this right. Obviously for this one, you just want to adjust the mirror so that you can see right behind you. Say you're in that car there and you want to be in this lane. What would you do? You check your side view mirror you don't see a car there, so you pull on in, but suddenly, boom, there's a car there. Now, if your mirror had been properly adjusted, this is what you would have seen. Take a moment to adjust your mirrors properly. A well-adjusted mirror could save your life. I'm Travis Tucker, reminding you to buckle up, adjust your mirrors, and drive safe. Once you and your teen have your seat belts on and have adjusted the mirrors, you are ready to start driving. Let's go over some additional information about driving. 
please raise your hand if you believe this statement is true. The safest position to place your hands on the steering wheel for most driving situations is 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. False. Placing your hands on the lower half of the steering wheel at 8 and 4 is the safest hand position for most driving situations. Steering is one of the most important and fun things about driving because it puts you in control of the car. Proper hand placement can ensure efficiency and enhance safety when driving. Today we'll learn the proper way to hold a steering wheel and we'll discuss the push, pull, and slide method for steering. Steering may seem simple, but there are many misconceptions about where to put your hands. Proper hand placement could prevent a crash or serious injury. Think of the steering wheel like a clock with 12 at the top. Most people think that you should put your hands at 10 and 2. The 10 to 2 hand placement is not ideal because the arms can become tired and it creates unnecessary movement. It also forces the driver to cross their arms when turning. In the event of a crash and airbag deployment, this could cause serious injury. Oh! The proper place to put your hands is actually at 8 and 4. Putting your hands in this position is not only more efficient, but it's also safer. Once our hands are in this position, we can use the push, pull, and slide method for turning. Using the push, pull, slide method, use one hand to push the steering wheel, the other to pull, and then slide your hands to return to the eight and four position. This will prevent your arms from crossing and slamming into your face in case of a crash. These steering techniques that we've reviewed may seem simple, but they're vital to the safe operation of your vehicle. By merely changing your hand placement, you could prevent a crash or a serious injury. Do your part to keep yourself and the roadway safe. Everyone, please sit up and assume a driving position with your hands holding the top of the steering wheel at 10 and 2. Keep holding this position and nod your heads if you think your arms and shoulders will become fatigued. Now move your hands from 10 and 2 down to the 8 and 4 position. This more relaxed position reduces muscle tension and unnecessary wheel movement caused by the weight of the arms placing your hands at the 8 and 4 position also takes your arms out of the path of the airbag, reducing hand, arm, and face injuries if the bag deploys. You should always wear your seatbelt and sit at least 10 inches from the airbag. If you can adjust the angle of the steering wheel, make sure the airbag is pointed at your chest and not at your face. Holding the steering wheel at the bottom also reduces the tendency to move the steering wheel too much, which may result in loss of control or running off the road. Running off the road is very hazardous, especially to novice drivers. Please take a moment to discuss with your teen three reasons drivers run off the road. Most run off the road crashes are caused by driver error. These include overcompensation, such as not using eight and four hand position, Poor directional control, meaning not looking where you want the vehicle to go. Driving too fast for curves, because inertia will pull the vehicle in a straight line. Driving too fast for conditions, such as bad weather. Incorrect evasion for animals or other obstacles in path of travel. Distractions inside and outside of the vehicle and driving while drowsy. Rumble strips alert the driver when they are running off the road. Practice riding on the rumble strips to desensitize your teen to overcome panicking and or overreacting. With practice, safe off-road recovery is not a difficult skill to learn. Today we're going to talk about one of the frequent causes behind fatal car accidents among seasoned and novice drivers alike. That is, veering off the road and then overcorrecting to try to return back to the road. Let me demonstrate. The natural reaction when you veer off the road is to yank on the steering wheel to get back on the road and slam on the brakes. However, this can cause the car to roll over or veer sharply into oncoming traffic or some other obstacle. The results can be deadly. Everyone needs to be prepared for this situation and new drivers should practice how to control the car if the car goes off the roadway. 
Parents should first stress to their new drivers the dangerous consequences of not paying full attention to the job of driving. Driving requires full attention every second. Talking on the phone, fiddling with the radio, talking to passengers, reaching for a drink, or a multitude of other distractions can cause a driver to veer off the road. It can happen in an instant. Stay focused and alert while driving. However, if this happens, with practice, the proper off-road recovery can be learned. Parents should consider practicing and demonstrating this skill before asking their teenager to do it. Maybe this is something that they've never done before. They could benefit from this as well. First, it's important for a parent to find a straight section of roadway with no traffic and a gravel, dirt, or grass shoulder that's even with the road surface where you can practice. Don't practice this skill on a road that drops off at the edge or has potholes or obstacles on the shoulder. Under these circumstances, the novice driver could easily lose control and do serious damage to your vehicle. Even at slow speeds, dirt or loose gravel can reduce traction causing the vehicle to slide or skid. So once you have found a place to practice, safely proceed at a very slow speed. First, as the driver steers slightly right, the front right tire will leave the roadway and the rear right tire will quickly follow. The driver must take his or her foot off the accelerator pedal and not brake or brake very gently. The vehicle must stay parallel to the paved portion of the road. If the circumstances permit, the novice driver should drive on the shoulder or on the dirt or rumble strip for a period of time to get the feel of the vehicle in this situation. In a real situation, the car may kick up rocks and other debris. Then, the driver should check traffic and ease back onto the road at a slow speed. The main thing to remember is not to panic. Knowing how to react to a situation before it happens is your best defense. I'm Travis Tucker, reminding you to pay attention and drive safely. Your vehicle is controlled by the four small patches of tire in contact with the ground. The word traction refers in general to your car's ability to maintain adhesive friction between the vehicles, specifically your tires, and the pavement. Vehicle control and performance is affected by the traction between the tire patches and the road surface. These patches are about the size of a dollar bill. Without traction, you have no control. Road surface. The single most important factor affecting the potential for a car to skid is the condition of the roadway. Is it asphalt or concrete, rough or smooth? Think of sandpaper. It has different grades of roughness. The coarser the sandpaper, the more friction it presents to the surface being sanded. Road conditions are not the same as road surface. Different road conditions present varying friction opportunities to the tires. A coarse roadway in the rain will hold less firmly than that same highway that it's bone dry. Likewise, snow covered pavement will present even fewer friction possibilities to the tires. Think about the speed and direction of the vehicle. The faster you go, the more energy the vehicle must dissipate before it comes to a stop. And if the road is heading east and your car is going north, you have a problem. Parents, if you do not want your teen to crash, teach them how to manage space, especially the space located in front of the vehicle. This is the easiest and most important space that a driver can control. If you have adequate space between your vehicle and the vehicle in front, you can brake or steer out of a trouble and avoid a crash. The chart provides the recommended following distance in seconds on dry surfaces for various speeds. Let's address a provisional license and graduated licensing requirements. When your teen has held his or her learner's permit for nine months, has completed at least 45 hours of driving with parent guardian guidance, is 16 years and three months old and successfully completed classroom driver education and behind the wheel course with a road test, then your teen is ready to earn their provisional driver's license. To obtain a driver's license in Virginia for anyone under 18, your student must be at least 16 years and three months old, practice driving with a learner's permit for at least nine months, complete 45 hours of guided practice with a parent or guardian, and successfully complete a state-approved classroom and behind-the-wheel in-car driver education program. Driving is the number one health risk for teens, and that's why most classroom driver education courses are offered as part of the 10th grade health education. Classroom driver education is a comprehensive course that covers a variety of traffic safety 
and driver-related information, such as the basic rules of the road, licensing procedure, vehicle dynamics, management of time and space, sharing the roadway, motorcycles and tractor trailers, purchasing and insuring a vehicle, reading a map, using GPS, the dangers of alcohol and other drugs in driving, texting and driving, and drowsy driving. Upon successful completion of a classroom driver education course, your child will receive a classroom driver education certificate of completion, also referred to as a DEC card. Your child needs this card to be eligible to take in-car instruction. In-car instruction is available before or after school during the school year and offered during the summer at your student's school. Once teens have their permit and have completed classroom driver education, they can register for a behind the wheel program. In behind the wheel, your student will drive for seven periods and observe for seven periods and take a road test at the end of the course for a total of 14 periods of instruction. If your teen has held their permit for nine months, passes the road test and meets all of the other juvenile licensing requirements, including the 45 hour driving log requirement, the in-car teacher will issue your student a six-month provisional driver's license. When it comes to education and safety, a good driver education program might be among the most vital decisions a parent can make. Fortunately, finding a good driver's education program is easy, provided you know what to look for. It's a lot easier to let your teen behind the wheel if you know that they've learned valuable skills from a good driver education teacher and experienced 45 hours or more of driving with parent guardian guided practice. It is good to remember that parents are responsible for consenting to licensure. Parents must sign the DMV learner's permit application, the parent permission form to take driver education, and the 45 hour driving log, and the student's six month temporary driver's license. Once your student driver has successfully completed classroom and in-car instruction and meets all the licensing requirements, with your parent permission, the in-car teacher can issue a six-month temporary provisional driver's license to your student driver. The Behind the Wheel School will give a copy of your student's six-month license to you and send another copy to DMV. While parents consent to licensure, the Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court is also involved in granting the privilege of driving. The DMV will process the six-month license and send a license valid for eight years for your student to the Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court that serves your family zip code. Consequently, it is very important that DMV has a correct address to send the hard copy to the court. Within six months of earning the temporary driver's license, the student and parent guardian may receive an invitation to attend a juvenile's license ceremony to obtain the permanent hard copy of the license or it will be mailed directly to the parent guardian. Courts may now hold ceremonies in person, hold ceremonies in an alternate manner, or waive them. Once your teen has their license, can they just hop in the car with all their friends and drive anytime they want to? No, they have a provisional driver's license. Virginia has graduated licensing laws for those under 18. Virginia law allows a driver under 18 years old with the provisional license to have no more than one non-family passenger under the age of 21 in the car until they have held their license for one year. Please remember that even one passenger is a distraction and there is a direct correlation between the number of passengers and crash probability. We are hoping that your family's rules is no passengers. True or false? Virginia allows three non-family teenage passengers to ride in a car driven by a driver who has just turned 17 years old. That is false. Your student must be at least 17 years and three months old to have more than one passenger and have held their license for a full year. After the first year of driving, Virginia Laws allows the young driver to have three non-family passengers less than 21 years of age under the following circumstances. When driving to and from a school activity, when a licensed driver 21 years or older is in the front passenger seat and in cases of an emergency. That's Virginia's passenger law, but it may not be the best practice. 
We hope that you will consider adopting a no passenger rule for your family. Why are there passenger restrictions? We are all highly influenced by our peers. Everyone wants to feel like they are accepted and a part of a group. Peer opinions and relationships are highly valued by teens and may influence your student's decision making in a positive or negative way. For example, if members of your teen's peer group wear seat belts, they probably will all wear seat belts. If their peer group is into street racing, your child may also be at risk and engage in this behavior. For the new teenage driver, good driving habits are gained by experience, practice, and following state graduated licensing laws. Speeding, driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs, not wearing seat belts, and texting while driving are all extremely dangerous and against the law. But there's another distraction that is very dangerous and not as well known, teen passengers. Research reveals that the number of passengers in a teenager's car greatly increases the chances of a crash. In fact, a recent AAA study revealed that one passenger in a car increases the risk of death by 44%. Add one more passenger and that risk doubles. Add another and it quadruples. These are alarming rates and not familiar to many parents. Virginia's graduated driver licensing laws limits the number of passengers that a teen driver can carry during his or her first year of independent driving. Parents, enforce this law. Encourage your teen to abide by passenger restriction laws and make them understand that driving with additional teen passengers puts them at an increased risk of being in a fatal crash. Is it worth the risk? Compared to driving with no passengers, a 16 or 17 year old driver's risk of death per mile driven increases 44% when carrying one passenger younger than 21 doubles when carrying two passengers younger than 21, quadruples when carrying three or more passengers younger than 21, decreases 62% when a passenger age 35 or older is in the vehicle. The good news is parents can keep their teens safe by instituting a no passenger policy for their teen drivers. Please raise your hand if you think this statement is true. In Virginia, curfew for drivers under the age of 18 is from midnight until 4 a.m. This is true. Under most circumstances, Virginia law does not allow drivers under the age of 18 with a learner's permit or a driver's license to drive from midnight to 4 a.m. In fact, statistics show that it is very dangerous for teenagers to drive after 7 p.m. Curfew laws can vary by county. For drivers of all ages, fatal crashes are more likely to occur at night but the risk is highest for teens. Low visibility and fatigue contribute to these crashes. Parents need to make sure their child receives adequate guided practice in these low visibility driving environments. Parents also need to closely monitor after school and weekend activities and place restrictions on driving at night. Let's talk about a few other things parents and teens should consider as teens begin gaining experience driving. Raise your hand if you slept at least eight hours last night. Did you know that teens need about nine hours of sleep per night, but on average only get about seven? Young drivers are at highest risk for drowsy driving, which causes thousands of crashes every year. Teens are most tired and at risk when driving in the early morning or late at night. Be sure your student is fully rested before getting behind the wheel. Teen drivers only comprise 14% of all drivers but are involved in 50% of crashes caused by drowsy driving. Drowsiness makes drivers less attentive, slows reaction time, and affects a driver's ability to make decisions. Driving while fatigued has been compared to driving while intoxicated. Being awake for 18 hours causes the brain to function at the same level as a brain that is legally intoxicated. Unfortunately, teens have schedules that cause them to be sleep deprived. To put it in perspective, a typical high school student gets up for school at 6 o'clock a.m., goes to school and attends after school activities, comes home, eats dinner, heads to a friend's house at 9 p.m., 
and then arrives home at midnight. This student has been up for 18 hours, and if the student drives, the student is an impaired driver. Distracted driving is a major contributor to accidents. Anything that takes your attention off the task of driving is a distraction. If you are a distracted driver, your crash risk will increase four to nine times more than a non-distracted driver. Students, in the next 10 seconds, list five driving distractions. Did you include swatting a fly, changing the radio, talking to passengers? Please raise your hand if you think this statement is true. Teen drivers under 18 may use a cell phone but cannot text message while driving a vehicle. That is false. It is now illegal for anyone to hold a cell phone or text while driving in Virginia. If you are under 18, you may not even use a hands-free wireless device. If a teen driver violates Virginia cell phone law, they will be assessed three demerit points and pay a fine. A second conviction will result in a court suspension of the teen's driving privileges for six months. In addition, drivers under age 20 who receive a demerit point conviction are required to attend a driver improvement clinic and cannot take an online driver improvement course. It's $125 for the first offense and $250 for repeat offenses for cell phone violations. Thumbs up if you think a teen driver's cell phone violation will affect your family's car insurance. Text messaging has increased the risk of a crash or near crash by two times and results in drivers taking their eyes off the road for an average of 23 seconds total. Activities performed when completing a phone call, such as reaching for a phone, looking up a contact, and dialing the phone number, increases the crash risk by three times. Can you talk on the phone and write an email at the same time? Not well, because your brain will divide attention between the tasks, focusing on one task and then the other. If you think you're good at doing several things at once, think again. Multitasking is a myth. Your brain can't do it. When you switch from one task to another, you are actually dividing your attention between multiple tasks. You can't simultaneously talk on the phone and type a coherent email. Parents, please have a zero tolerance policy on texting and driving. Tell your teen to turn off their phone while driving or check out the do not disturb feature. Did you know that the most frequent comment drivers make immediately after a crash is, I didn't see you. The reason they did not see you is they were probably driving while distracted. In a CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 39% of teens surveyed admit that they text while driving and texting while driving unfortunately increases with age. This is truly frightening statistic for all drivers. As a parent, this may be the most important family rule that you enforce. Parental influence on teen cell phone behaviors is stronger and longer lasting than all other influences, and teens learn from watching adults. So parents, please encourage safe driving behaviors by modeling them. Grant Hendricks. I'm a trooper with the Missouri State Highway Patrol. I'm at the site of Mariah West's accident. Mariah's vehicle traveled across this median and ended in uh, striking the bridge that you can see behind me. When I got to the scene, her face was disfigured from sliding down the roadway. It's funny, the, the first thing I noticed about her was her shoes. <laughs> Lying in the roadway in a, in a large pool of blood, I noticed her shoes and I thought, this is a young girl. That's the first thing I thought when I saw this. And at that point is when I noticed her cap and gown was still in her car. She was going to graduate the next day. It was just a really horrific scene. All because of a senseless text message.
it's just sad. Sorry, it's just sad. Ashley would text hundreds of messages every day. That was the way we kept in touch. We would definitely text more than we talked. Mariah was a multitasker extraordinaire. She could text better than anyone I know. She could be having one conversation with me completely focused while having a text conversation with somebody else. We'd be at school, at home, movies, bowling, driving, not even looking at her phone. It didn't matter where we were, we were constantly texting. This is my sister. She was looking at my message that I had just sent her. When she looked up, she had clipped the median on the left-hand side of the road. Her truck flipped, and as it was flipping, she was actually ejected through the driver's side door, and she landed in the ditch about 300 feet from her truck. People will tell you over and over again, it's not your fault. But knowing that you were the person that she was talking to, when she was killed. Just knowing, having a highway patrol officer write in a report that a text message sent at 12.05 is the reason that she is dead is not something that will ever go away. If I could talk to her one last time, I would just say I'm sorry. This is her cell phone that she used in the accident. Four little letters. That's what killed her. She paid the ultimate price for her actions. I've had to do this more than once. Mariah is not the only, the only victim that I've dealt with. And it never gets any easier. And it won't get any easier. What is worth losing your life over? that text message Parents, you should be concerned about underage drinking. The research indicates alcohol damages young, developing brain cells, and the teen brain is more susceptible than their adult counterparts to alcohol-induced toxicity. An experiment in which rat brain cells were exposed to alcohol showed alcohol blocked certain synaptic activity. When the alcohol was removed, the adult cells recovered while the adolescent cells remained disabled. Please raise your hand if you believe this statement is true. A friend who has only one drink is a safe choice for a designated driver. Alcohol slows down reaction time and impairs judgment and coordination, which are all skills needed to drive a car safely. The more alcohol consumed, the greater the impairment. Legal limits do not define a level below which is safe to operate a vehicle or engage in some other activity. Impairment due to alcohol use begins to occur at levels well below the legal limit. In Virginia, the legal limit for young people under 21 is a blood alcohol content of 0 .02. This is the average blood alcohol level that occurs normally in a body. So the legal drinking limit for drivers under the age of 21 in Virginia is zero alcoholic drinks. It's not just the driver who is at risk from drinking. In this national survey, one in four high school students reported having ridden in a car in the last month that was driven by someone who had been drinking. In Virginia, 
One third of teenagers aged 15 to 19 who died in car crashes were passengers. So, if you are riding with a driver who has been drinking or doing drugs, you are putting your life in grave danger. These survey results are a reminder that parents need to always know who your teens are with. Establish a relationship with your children so that in the event your teen has to choose between riding with an impaired driver and calling home for a ride, they will choose to call you. It is also imperative that parents uphold their end of the bargain and recognize and compliment teens when they use good judgment and make mature decisions. It is against the law in Virginia for teens to drink alcohol. Teens, alcohol and drugs are illegal slow your reaction time, and distort reality. Paradoxically, while impairing you, alcohol may make you think you're an awesome driver. Avoid this bad combination. Don't drink and drive. Parents, do you know where your teens are getting the alcohol? Well, in addition to friends and older siblings, studies show that parents in the community are the primary suppliers of alcohol to underage youth. Please think carefully about the potential consequences to your teens and to you and have necessary conversations about expectations with other parents in the community. Studies have shown that adult supervised settings for alcohol use, intended to minimize harm, actually result in higher levels of harmful alcohol consequences for young people. Virginia has a zero-tolerance law for those under age 21 who drink and drive, meaning that if you are convicted of driving after illegally consuming alcohol, the penalty includes losing your driving privilege for one year and a minimum mandatory fine of $500 or 50 hours of community service. Most states have zero tolerance laws to prevent accidents from underage drinking to protect the young, developing brain. If your teen makes the mistake and attends a party where there is alcohol, the judge may impose a $500 fine or community service and suspend your child's license or the ability to get a license for one year. This suspension will also have an impact on your family's car insurance. Additional violation of underage drinking and driving laws can result in more substantial financial penalties, jail time, probation, and counseling requirements, as well as impact college admissions, scholarships, financial aid, and employment opportunities. Driving after taking certain medications, marijuana, and all illegal drugs is risky and can cause traffic crashes, injuries, and fatalities. Similar to driving after consuming alcohol, drivers cannot judge their own level of impairment after smoking marijuana or taking other illegal drugs, so any amount of consumption puts them and others at risk. Also similar to driving under the influence of alcohol, those who drive high on drugs could get a DUI. Law enforcement officers across Virginia are specially trained to recognize drug drivers. According to a recent roadside study by the National Highway Traffic Administration, one in four drivers on America's roads tested positive for at least one drug that impacts safety. It is a fact that parents are the key to good decision-making related to drinking and driving. Research has shown that young people are less likely to drink when parents are involved in their lives and have close relationships with them. Adolescents are less likely to drink and have alcohol-related problems when their parents set clear rules and expectations about drinking, have good parent-child communication, and discipline consistently. Parents' drinking behaviors and favorable attitudes about not drinking and not using drugs influence adolescents to abstain, and parents who exhibit DUI behavior promote youth DUI behaviors. Furthermore, Parental permissiveness is positively and consistently associated with negative drinking consequences as youth transition to college or adulthood. Have the conversation with your teen about drinking and drug driving. Dialogue with teens is essential to afford them the resources and skills to make good decisions about drinking and driving. MAD will send you a list of conversation starters so you can talk to your teen. Parents may feel uncomfortable talking to their teens about underage drinking because they drank as teens. MAD offers the following sample dialogue in response to teens' questions about a parent's adolescent drinking. I did have a drink when I was younger. However, we did not know as much as we know now about the risk of alcohol. If I had known then, 
I would have done things differently. This is why I'm talking to you about it. I want you to be safe, healthy, and happy. Speeding is another risk for teen drivers. Why are more males killed in crashes? Because they tend to drive at higher speeds and take more risk, and safety belt use is lower among males. Speed increases the distance a vehicle travels from the time a driver detects an emergency to the time the driver reacts, and it also increases the distance needed to stop a vehicle once the driver starts to brake. Speed increases crash energy exponentially, and there are limits to the amount of crash energy that can be managed by vehicles, restraint systems, and roadway protections, such as barriers and crash cushions. The higher the speed, the greater the likelihood these limits will be exceeded in crashes, limiting the protection available for the vehicle occupants. Higher speed limits are associated with an increased likelihood of deaths and incapacitating injuries. Increasing a speed limit from 55 to 65 miles per hour results in about a 3% increase in the total number of crashes and a 24% increase in the likelihood that a vehicle occupant will be fatally injured. Give a thumbs up if you believe the statement is true or thumbs down if you believe this statement is false. The family car is the safest car for your teen to drive. This is true. The family car is by far the safest car. Parents who have a car waiting in the driveway for their new driver should be mindful that the research shows that their child will be more likely to be in a crash. By having a family car, the teen will have to ask to borrow it. This provides the parent with the opportunity to review family rules and restrictions and control access to the vehicle, which will make the teen driver much safer. Law enforcement plays a critical role in traffic safety. When traffic laws are actively enforced, our roads are safer. If you are stopped by a police officer, remain calm. Move your vehicle out of the flow of traffic, onto the right shoulder of the roadway, and position your vehicle as far away from traffic as possible. Turn on your flashers and turn off your engine. Lower your window. Keep the safety belt on in your hands in plain view on the steering wheel. Do not get out of the car unless directed to do so by the officer. Passengers should remain in their seats with their safety belts fastened. Answer all the officer's questions calmly and clearly, and follow all directions and instructions. There are about 2,000 troopers in Virginia, and they all have one thing in common. They all have been struck or nearly struck by passing motorists while performing their duties on Virginia's highways. So if you see an emergency vehicle stopped on the shoulder of a highway, the law requires you to change lanes away from the stopped emergency vehicle. And if you can't change lanes, you must slow down and pass with caution. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. Let's review the role of parents. Please raise your hand if you believe this statement is true. Peers have the greatest influence on teen driving behaviors. This is false. Nine out of ten teen drivers identified their parents as having the greatest influence on their driving behaviors. The next most influential groups in order are law enforcement, peers, and driver education teachers. Although the General Assembly allows your child to get a license at 16 years and 3 months of age, the parents, not the state, are in the best position to determine whether the teen is ready to drive alone at that age. When parents determine their children are ready to drive, parents can help their children become a safe driver if they are a good role model. Do as I say, not as I do, just does not work. Allowing your teen to get a license does not mean your child no longer needs your supervision and guidance. By placing restrictions on high-risk driving, such as driving at night or with passengers, you will make your teen much safer. Parents may suspend their child's driving privileges if your child is not demonstrating safe and responsible behaviors. Virginia law puts parents in the driver's seat to monitor safe teen driving behaviors. Let's talk about a parent-teen driving contract. Parents, you must establish family laws that place limits on when, where, 
and with whom your teen may drive. Don't assume that state laws will keep your teen safe. State laws represent the minimum restrictions placed on new drivers. Family laws, on the other hand, crafted by the parent, the person who knows the teen the best, will make the teen much, much safer. Your family laws should include protections such as no cell phones, no text messaging, no passengers, no night driving, and zero tolerance for tickets. Teens who have written contracts that outline family rules and set limits on initial driving privileges such as no driving at night and no passengers and have a clear consequences for breaking the rules are much less likely to engage in risky driving, have crashes, or get a ticket. Throughout this program, we have stressed the importance of parent involvement and teen driver safety. Parents and teens should have a written driving contract and agree upon rules and consequences, driving limits, where and when the teen can drive, financial responsibilities, how privileges can be increased, and no drinking or drug driving. The number one crash risk for teens is actually inexperience. Their very riskiest time is the first six months of driving. That's when the parent needs to really closely monitor what's happening. It's important to, to let her know all the consequences and things that if she doesn't follow through, she'll know what I expect from her. She'll know what she's supposed to do, what's wrong, what's right. One of the things that's really wonderful about driving is that it is a time when teens and parents have to work together on something. And the parent-teen driver agreement is a document that can get parents and teens to begin a conversation about safe driving. My mom has talked to me about the responsibilities of being a good driver and following the rules. Yeah, following the <laughs> rules. The parent-teen driver agreement has a basic outline of rules that the teen should follow in order to keep them safe. We encourage parents to limit the conditions under which teens can drive to daytime or at least not very late and zero or one passenger or no inclement weather driving. Fairly basic things. And it also lets the teen and the parent work together to set up the consequences. Let's talk about the consequences. Curfew violation. Yeah, we have issues with that one. What if it's 30 minutes? No, it's not up for discussion about that. Violation, curfew, you need to just respect that. It's about progressively giving them privileges as they show that they can handle a highway and many other situations that they're going to be facing. One of my biggest fears is they should get being distracted while she's driving. I just need her to be focused. My biggest fears and worries are that I won't drive good enough or I'll get in a car accident. My mom's expectations are that I just follow whatever she says, follow the law, and be the best driver. Teens who report that their parents would be very upset with them if they engaged in risky driving behavior report much less risky driving behavior and they report fewer violations of the law. If I do something, I can't just talk her out of it because it's on paper. If it wasn't on paper, I could just lie and be like, you never <laughs> said that, but since it's on paper, I know she's going to go back a lot and look at it. Yeah, I might frame it. Parent Guardian and Teen Driving Agreement is available in the 45-Hour Parent Teen Driving Guide, and this QR code will also take you to a Parent Guardian and Teen Contract on the Partners for Safe Teen Driving webpage. We hope that you invest the time to complete the contract together. These are some of the new laws to be aware of as of July 1, 2022. Those on bicycles, scooters, skateboards, and other vehicles are allowed to ride two abreast in a lane, but they must move to a single file as quickly as possible when approached by a faster-moving vehicle. Drivers must change lanes when passing a cyclist if the lane is not wide enough to allow at least three feet of distance between the driver and the cyclist. 
It is now a Class 1 misdemeanor to operate a vehicle in a careless or distracted manner and cause the death or serious bodily injury of a vulnerable road user. Vulnerable road users are people unprotected by an outside shield. Here are a couple of reminders. Marijuana is illegal for those age 20 and younger. It is illegal to drive under the influence of cannabis and to have it on school grounds. Drivers must change lanes when passing a cyclist if the lane is not wide enough to allow at least three feet of distance between the driver and the cyclist. Those on bicycles, scooters, or other vehicles must move to a single file formation when approached by a faster moving vehicle. It is illegal for all drivers to hold a cell phone while driving. Parents, guardians, and students, please take a few minutes to complete the online evaluation using these QR codes. Thank you for attending the 90-minute Parent Teen Driving Presentation. Parents, we hope the information shared today will help you help your teen become a safer driver.